Well, good Tuesday morning. I set up this camera myself. Figured I need to learn it. My son Jacob, he's great with it and everything, and he'll teach me some things, but I want to do my videos early in the morning. It's like 4.20 in the morning, so I figured why not. I'll set it up myself and see how it works out. And I think it'll work out just fine. Ooh, I'll be happy when these pills are done. I tell you, it's draining my energy. But um, I'm surviving it. And God has given me His grace, His grace through this affliction, very important, to recognize the grace of God. This is what we have. Going through any affliction, we have the grace of God. And our focus should be that, that no matter what we go through, we rely on the grace of God because it's sufficient for us. All right, I'm going to continue with this article this morning, and this part is the blood of the cross. <clears throat> the blood of the cross. <laughs> My voice just went there for a minute. All right, the cross was the supreme crisis in universal history, an event unique, unparalleled in the annals of time. Nothing has ever occurred which has such profound effect upon the world. It will trans transform an alienated universe into adorable and adoring worshipers. It is a permanent and abiding power which will never lose its potency. Today the cross avails to conciliate the world and to reconcile those who receive the conciliation. But this will but be by no means exhaust its power. It will be the basis of all blessings in the eons to come and will bring immortality and peace to all at the consummation. All will receive immortality at the consummation. We receive it. The next ones who receive it are the members of the body of Christ. We go from mortal to immortal instantly if we survive to the presence of the Lord. Death cannot stop its course, for Christ arose, the firstborn, and all for whom he died, and he died for all, will share his life when death is finally abolished. The blood of Christ is a most expressive figure of permanent power of his sufferings. The soul, sensation, or feeling, not the life, of the flesh is in the blood. In the days of old, this was sprinkled in the Holy of Holies once a year on the day of propitiation, and for a twelve-month preserve, for twelve months, preserved the potency of the sacrifice. So it is with the suffering of Christ. Thank God it is past, but its potency is permanent. It avails today and will never lose its power. The blood remains, as it were, within the holiest in heaven, to witness to his offering. But the blood of his cross, this goes far deeper still. Only here do we have this notable expression. It is not a mere literary variant, but a deliberate endeavor to distinguish between the death of God's Son and the manner of it. This is done because here we, are, we have not merely the salvation or the justification of all, but the reconciliation of the whole universe. It is not a question of sin, so much uh, as of offense and enmity. In fact, this passage is concerned with salvation only insofar as it is, is included in the reconciliation. Peace is made by the blood of his cross. The blood is a reminder of its permanence. The blood does not merely remind us of his death and suffering, but of the shame and enmity of man and the darkness and distance from God endured by him because of the crucifixion. Stoning would have brought death, but would have avoided much of the suffering and the curse of the deity which rested upon the one who was hanged upon the tree. The marvelous truth that all will be reconciled to God is based not only on the suffering and death of Christ, but especially on the abject ab abasement involved in the manner of his death, coupled with the curse which it drew down from above. The cry of the August sufferer, My God, my God, why didst thou forsake me? finds its answer in the cross. With any other form of death, God would have not forsaken him. He would rather have turned against his murderers. It would have increased the distance and estrangement between God and his creatures. It would have made enmity not peace. 
But because he voluntarily placed himself beneath the curse of God for the sake of his enemies, the result was reconciliation. But let us note that the cross is brought here, parenthetically. It is the basis of reconciliation indeed, but by no means includes all that he will do in order to bring back the universe to God. On this basis he will carry all, on all, of his future work of ruling and, re ruling and reigning and judging, of rousing and vivification of the de vivifying the dead. All of his coming acts will have this grand goal in view, and we will have our share in his work of reconciling God's creatures among the celestials. For we are his complement, a living exemplification of the power of the cross. We will have our part in the final and effectual peace propaganda. For this reason we read here of the blood of the cross, for its abiding power will be, be the means at our disposal to bring about perpetual peace. One of the most helpful contrasts between Ephesians and Colossians is on the subject of peace. In Colossians, as we have seen, it is universal in its scope, including not only earth sinners, but his enemies in the heavens as well. But in Ephesians, it is limited to believers and has to do with the enmity between circ the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. This estrangement in here in their flesh and in the physical relation to, of Christ to the circumcision. It found expression in the central wall in the sanctuary, which kept the uncircumcision, uncircumcision at a distance from God's dwelling place, and in the decrees issued by the apostles from Jerusalem. The fruit of peace was a new humanity, so that both circumcision and, un, and the uncircumcision have access in one spirit to the Father, Though based upon the cross, there is nothing there for those outside the household of faith. The peace of Ephesians, in accord with the secret of the epistle, will continue during this administration of grace, but will retire in the following economies, when Israel once more comes to the front of the basis of physical preeminence. But the peace in Colossians, in accord with the secret of Christ, will not only continue throughout the eons, but will embrace all at the consummation. In Ephesians, it is limited to in both time and scope. It applies only to the circumcision and uncircumcision in this present era. But in Colossians, it is extended to include those in the heavens as well as those on the earth. All are embraced by it, so that no enmity remains in God's universe. To even list all the passages which, which have brought, been brought forward to blot out the great truth of the reconciliation of all would lead us too far afield at this time. They have been fully considered and discussed in separate essays. Correct, concordant renderings automatically dispose of them. The false teaching, the false translations, and at the same time confirm the great truth that God will become all in all at the consummation. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. May God graciously give us faith to believe it. May our love for his beloved constrain us to receive it. May mis mistaken translations of other passages not bar our way into the ho this holy of holies, beyond the veil of his Ionian dealings with his creatures. May not the false philosophical terms, everlasting, eternal, an eternity blind our eyes to the eons the scene of the sun's glories their commencement in love and their consummation in reconciliation here we stand on the summit of divine revelation here we can see all else below us and see its place in God's purpose May we not take some lower stand and deny this glorious consummation because it is hid from our gaze by the fogs of the lower levels. And isn't it true that the world is in a deep fog? It cannot see through it. It does not see God, the God of the universe. It sees its religion. It sees its human philosophy. It sees all its false teachings, its doctrines of demons. It sees all that through that fog. God will bring them out and reconcile them. 
We have the celestial realm. Israel has the earth, the terrestrial realm. We have the celestial realm to reconcile back to God. And this is our job. And this is what we look forward to. What is our expectation? Not only to be changed and vivified and the dead in Christ raised first. And we at the same time be vivified, snatched away to meet our Lord in the air. We have that celestial realm, man. The vast celestial realm to reconcile back to God. What an expectation, yes. This is what we hold on to. God is not slack. God is not on plan B. He's on plan A and he's, still, he's always been on plan A. He's going to reconcile his universe. He knew the end from the beginning, right from the get-go. Do we worry about our trivial daily actions or whatever we do in this lifetime? No. As members of the body of Christ, we don't. We are free in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. Nothing we do can screw it up. So remember this. As you go about your Tuesday, have a wonderful day in the Lord. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you tomorrow.